Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Mormon Stories Podcast. I'm your host, John DeLynn. It is June 28th, 2018. And uh, as always, I am so very excited uh, to be interviewing uh, the people that we're interviewing today. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, um, we have a new LGBTQ-themed documentary that's come out, and it may not be the one you think I'm thinking about. Uh, the documentary is called Church and State. Um, and it's a documentary about the role that Utah played in uh, same-sex marriage becoming legalized across the United States. Um, I, uh, I watched the movie last night, um, and I loved it. And uh, to be honest, you know, I've been studying LGBT stuff for quite some time. I've been involved in my little ways for many, many years. I wasn't sure how interested or excited I would be about an LGBT-themed documentary. And uh, I was super enthralled from the very start. I thought it was a very high quality movie, um, very well done, uh, very, very thoughtful and professional. And uh, given the people that were involved in it, I'm not surprised. But today we're going to be interviewing uh, three of the main people involved in this uh, wonderful documentary, again called Church and State. Um, before I introduce our guests, I want to let you all know that on July 18th, 2018, there will be a screening of this movie. That's a Wednesday night, 7 p.m. at the Broadway Theater in Salt Lake City. What I would love is for... Everyone in the Salt Lake area who supports Mormon Stories podcast, who supports local uh, art, cinema to show up. And we are going to do a, a screening of the movie, support uh, very well done local art. And then we'll do a Q&A with some of the participants of the movie uh, after the screening. And we'll just have some fun and we can hang out, eat popcorn, uh, maybe even have a lemonade. And so... Uh, we want to make sure you all come to that. So I'll announce that again at the end. You can go to mormonstories.org slash events uh, to get the details. But uh, please join us there. We're going to skip the normal uh, announcements for today. And I am very excited to uh, welcome three new guests to Mormon Stories podcast. These three, none of these three guests have ever been on Mormon Stories before. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the three people are, uh, I'll just introduce them one at a time. So first, James Huntsman. Uh, welcome to Mormon Stories. Thank you. Tell us a bit about yourself and your role in the movie. Well, thank you. Pleasure to be here. Long time listener. <laughs> First time participant, as you say. Uh, uh, my wonderful wife, Mary Ann, is here with us. Uh, we are the proud parents of five children. Um, and I got involved in this film a, a couple of years ago as a producer on the film. And also uh, my company, Blue Fox Entertainment, is the, is the company behind distributing the film uh, nationwide uh, in August. We're having a short theatrical run here locally because of the nature of the film, uh, but, but uh, my company, uh, Blue Fox Entertainment, will be handling the distribution of the film nationwide. And really, just really quick, what was it about the topic? What was your personal interest? Did you have a personal interest in the film? And if so, what was it? Well, uh, yes. Yeah, so at the time, we weren't living in Utah when this issue was happening in 2012, 2013, 2014. Um, and it was just by accident that I came in contact uh, with, with the actual footage. Uh, I was actually attending a, a fundraiser for Ben McAdams at Laziz Restaurant, which is operated by Derek and Moody. Uh, who are two of the plaintiffs in the film. And I was just, during that fundraiser, I was in the back of the room having a conversation with Moody. And he said... Who appears in the documentary. Who appears in the documentary. Um, and he uh, makes great hummus. He makes great this, hummus. This is Derek appear in the, in the film. <laughs> and he asked what I did, and I just said, I'm in film distribution, and, and the, the, the rest is history. So we came in contact uh, with footage of the film, and that's where I met Holly, uh, one of the co-directors of the film. And, geez, that was two... Over two years ago. Two years ago, yeah. yeah. It was November of uh, 2016. Yeah. Yeah. And is this a topic near and dear to your heart, James? Yeah, uh, yes, it is. Um, uh, but as a, as a distributor of content, it, it needs to do more than just have, have relevance to the distribution company. There needs to be an element in the film that actually you think is going to connect with the public. And in this particular film, we felt that there were three elements. Uh, one, just the, the case law, the, just the legal journey that this 
that the film covers. Um, number two, the LGBT issue, of course, um, and that in the state of Utah, and something obviously that's that I'm passionate about. And and you're on the board of Equality Utah. I'm on the board of Equality Utah. Yes. Um, and lastly, of course, the the fact that the Mormon Church was involved. Um, and the state of Utah was involved, and advocacy. You had all these interesting players that create an interesting backdrop to this story. So we felt that there were multiple elements that would be interesting to an audience, which is why we felt compelled as a distribution company to get involved with the film. Excellent. Well, welcome back. Welcome again to Mormon Stories. Thank you. It's good to have you. Okay. Uh, Holly Tuckett, uh, tell us about yourself and your role in this movie. Okay. Um, I am a local Utahn, born and raised. Um, I've been a filmmaker since about 2006. Um, I was originally brought onto the project as a producer, and um, we all picked up cameras right after Judge Shelby's ruling in uh, 2013, December. And basically followed the case. And when we got done with everything happened so fast for our case that we weren't sure where the story was going to go. And so being that we didn't have a budget, we didn't have, you know, the means to continue on editing and everybody all had different things that they were focusing on. The team kind of disbanded for a little while. And, you know, in the meantime, everybody's kind of still asking, and you know, how are we gonna get this film done? And uh, Derek and Moody and I and Kendall Wilcox had a meeting together and uh, talked about, you know, these are the things that need to happen. We need to find money to be able to pay somebody to help us finish it. And until that kind of happens, it's, it's going to be a slow process. So if we want it to go faster, we have to find money. And, you know, one day in November, I get a phone call from Derek and he said, I think I've, I think I've found the, the person who's going to help us finish it. And missing piece, Blue Fox missing piece, Blue Fox entertainment. <laughs> right. and, and your role in the movie is, I am a co-director co-director and producer. Okay. And I also did, um, I, not all the cinematography, but a, a, a large portion of the cinematography. And for Mormon Stories fans out there, uh, Holly was involved in the Jeremy Runnels episode, in the filming of the Jeremy Runnels episode. At least it was in your house or something like yes. that. Is that right? Yeah. It, I, I actually ran the camera. So I ran one of the cameras. We have Holly to thank yeah. for that epic, historic <laughs> top 10 Mormon Stories episode. That was a good, so that was a good episode. Thank you for being and, involved. And with can that. I just mention with that, when we mentioned uh, Kendall Wilcox, he's the other co-director. Yeah. He's not here with us today. I, I was going to bring him up. So, yeah. so we brought Kendall on... Shortly after he was, you know, fired from BYU, we're we're uh, generally Kendall Wilcox fans in terms of uh, a lot of the cool work he's done. We were excited about Far Between. I even personally donated money to Far Between. It never happened, and so I was like, "Are we ever going to hear from Kendall again?" So I was excited to see that you guys got him uh, yeah. delivering a film. Yeah. And, uh, I think I could see his footprint in the film. And yeah, definitely. So Kendall, Certainly. shout out to you. Nice work on the film. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, I really think that um, the relationship between Kendall and I uh, and the different uh, views that we have about the state and Mormonism and just everything. I bet it provided um, a creative tension. Well, I, and, and, but I think it provided a very good film because yeah. we challenged each other you know, to really give it balance, uh, to really fairness. keep it balanced and yeah. fair. And, um, and I, and I, so I think that, you know, it was a good collaboration in that way. You know, yeah. it really, it really was. Um, he's, he's been busy working on other things over the, over the last six months or so. And so, you know, he's, he's moving on to other projects. All right. Thanks Holly. Good. Mm -hmm. Welcome to Mormon stories. Thanks. And Mark, Mark Lawrence, we're going to get to you in just a second, okay. but just tell us just a tiny bit about yourself. Uh, Welcome to Warm Stories, by the way. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, I don't know what to tell you. I'm here, and uh, and this was something that was, I don't know how it happened. It was crazy. It happened so fast. Everything was so unexpected, and I just got used to people chasing me around with cameras. Give us a quick, just a, like a 30-second bio of your life prior to, you know, what the film tries, the story the film tries to tell. So you're... 
background as a human being is what? Born and raised in Salt Lake City, lived in San Francisco, California from 1982 to 2000. Uh, became very ill, three years of chemotherapy and cancer. Um, and, uh, and now I'm fine. And well, I did something. <laughs> congratulations. Back in 2013. You were raised Mormon, right? In a... I left the Mormon church very, very early. Right. Yeah. I never had what you would call a testimony. I never fell for the, the dogma, so uh, it was very easy for me to walk away from the LDS church. But you were gay, right? Mm -hmm. You are gay. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that, that was part of your journey to San Francisco, right? Yeah, I moved there right at the beginning of the AIDS crisis when everybody said, you must be nuts. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the film talks about, Mark, your early story, and we meet your parents in the film. And yeah. That was really fun. So, uh, my dad, unfortunately, he passed two years ago. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Uh, no, he had advanced Alzheimer's. It, yeah. it was good. Yeah. And, and really quick, who can talk to us about the awards that this film has received just so that yeah. people can know we're talking about a really good film here? Um, back in April, we were at the American Documentary Film Festival in Palm Springs, California, and we took the special jury award um, there and for best feature documentary. And then uh, just recently, we were at the Nice International Film Festival in Nice, France, where we took away the best feature documentary uh, for, for the whole festival. So, so, yeah, this is a quality film. Yeah. Uh, it has my endorsement. <laughs> All right. So um, I've got like a list of 30 questions. We're going to try and break a land speed record for Mormon Stories podcast today. So we're going to jump right in. All right. Um, so... Uh, one of the things I like about the movie is that it, it starts chronicling the LDS Church's involvement in the 19th century with sort of advocating non-traditional marriage mm -hmm. and religious freedom. And you want to talk just briefly about that part of the of the historical framing in the movie? Yeah, um, for us, it was really important to um, put a viewer that might not be from here into the context of why it's so unusual that gay marriage got over, you know, that, that we were able to overturn the ban and actually have gay marriage happen in Utah. And so in order to kind of contextualize it, we really felt that it was necessary to go back and give people a, a little bit of a history lesson of the struggles that the Mormon church went through just to move west like the the forces that were making them move west and the irony um without basically telling the viewer this is the irony um they were moved west because of non-traditional marriage um it was a big it was a big linchpin and we actually really i think do a great job of showing you how fervent that that hatred for Mormons was during that time. I shout out to Steve Urquhart, who is featured in this film, along with Bob Reese, along with, uh, you know, P Taylor Petrie, um, David Knowlton, David Knowlton, there a little bit. Greg Prince, Greg like a lot Prince. of cool people, mm -hmm. a lot of cool people in this film. Um, but I, I loved, I loved, uh, when Steve Urquhart said something like, the the more the persecution, the truer the church is. That yeah. the church got this persecution complex from the way it was treated around polygamy. And it even had a Supreme Court case around marriage in the late 19th century. Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of interesting, I don't know, parallels, non-parallels, yep. right? Is that, yeah, definitely. That's, that's kind of what you're saying. Yeah. So that's a fun thing to look for yeah. in, in the and footage. And it's subtle. We don't, we don't like, yeah, we, don't, yeah. we don't on the nose it. Yeah, like, you're, yeah. We, leave, we leave it to the viewer to really kind of take in what they're, what they're seeing and make those connections on their own. It's classy and thoughtful that way. Um, so when did the church, the LDS church, start to crystallize its rhetoric and its doctrine around uh, homosexuality, as they called it? Uh, Mid-50s, right? When, when kind of psychology started talking about homosexuality? Yeah. Yeah. In the 70s, they started doing things like BYU was having a lot of issues in the 70s. They were going after uh, LGBT people. Uh, the police on B BYU's campus were going off campus, making arrests, and uh, they started their uh, indoctrination program where they would basically they would they would get uh, gay students there and torture them. 
And uh, they still haven't resolved that. That's still that's what the electroshock therapy the electroshock stuff therapy, is going yes. on. Mm -hmm. And you, the movie has great, you know, statements from general authorities in general conference. Spencer W. Kimball, Boyd K. Packer. In fact, there was one, uh, you know, one of the quotes that people may not be familiar with is this quote in general conference where Boyd K. Packer is telling the story of two missionaries, and I guess there was a gay missionary and a straight missionary. Who wants to tell the story? It's not a fun quote, he, but... He, he basically uh, was, was for physically, physical violence against the gay, the gay mission. He basically says, I'm not advocating, I'm not necessarily recommending violence, but I'm not omitting it either. Yeah. Right. He's saying this in general conference, I think, and yeah. there's like this chuckle where the audience yeah. all kind of laughs with him. Right. Yeah. And it's basically an apostle of God kind of advocating violence against LGBT yeah. people, which I think was, for, kind I think, of takes your breath away. Yeah, yeah. and I think for us... The reason that we put it in the film is a lot of people have read that talk, but they have not seen yeah, it. Yeah, to see it is different. And to see yeah. it is really visceral because you, you, for lack of, I'm just going to call Boyd K. Packer out on it. God bless your soul. Um, you know, you really get to see him kind of almost egg the crowd. He's enjoying what he's, he's enjoying the responses that he's getting and he's enjoying what he's saying almost. And so it just really speaks to um, where the Mormon church was at that time frame um, on homosexuality and, and how they were treating homosexuals at that time. And I'm sure lots of religions were that way. Yeah, but okay. yeah, but kind of for those who way. think of it as God's one true church led by Jesus, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. You might want to, you would think the church would have a higher standard for that kind of thing, maybe. Yeah. But, is really fun and interesting. I mean, sad and terrible, but also But also kind of like fascinating. Yeah, to see yeah. that kind of stuff. So I love that part of the movie. Um, so let's start with just, it seems like Hawaii was kind of the big trigger for all of this. And, and I should just say, part of what makes this movie so important is because it's not often that Mormonism and Utah plays a central role in a major Supreme Court victory for social progress. And I think that's kind of what makes this movie so important to Mormons and to Utahns uh, and just to people who care about U.S. history. So I yeah. just wanted to state that. But was it Hawaii that kind of kicks it off? Yes. Who wants to talk about kind of what happened in Hawaii? And Well, it was in the mid-90s, and Hawaii was actually debating marriage equality in Hawaii. They would have been the first state to do it. And the LDS Church stepped right in and, and did everything they could possibly do to stop that. And so that's where it began. And was it legalized in Hawaii no. first? No, no, but, not but, in but the beginning. But the Hawaiian Supreme Court was considering it, yeah. yeah. And so that's when the church kind of like right. said, "Uh oh, we got to get busy." Right. Yeah. And wasn't that right around the time that Don H. Oaks was made an apostle? Yeah, and he has a good rich history of uh, gay bashing as well. He's got lots of history with that. Okay, so wait, Hawaii was what early nineties? Yeah, Hawaii mid -90s. was early mid nineties. Okay, so I'm, I'm wrong about something. Oaks was made an apostle in the early 80s. Yes. Okay. And tell us what his first assignment was that you cover in the his, documentary. His, his first assignment uh, that, that he was given was to, because, because he was a judge for the Utah Supreme Court, you know, he basically is very well versed in all legalese. And so uh, his job was to basically craft a document that would allow the Mormon church to insert themselves into the legal process that was going on in Hawaii. Because what happened is when they first started to try to get involved in Hawaii, Hawaii's court system basically said, you don't have any legal standing to be involved. And they wanted to be involved. So they basically created a document, which we all know now as the Proclamation of the Family. And it was, a, it was basically a document to give the church legal standing to oppose gay marriage because it was not their way of marrying. Yeah. And so uh, it, it became a, it was a legal document that then became doctrine, so right, to speak. Right, exactly. And one, I just think it's important to understand, in some ways Oaks was really prescient because his strategy memo in the early 80s became the roadmap for decades of the church's involvement through Hawaii, yeah. through Prop 8, you know, all the way through uh, this case. Yeah. Uh, and it has to do with legal lobbying at the state level and all the sorts mm -hmm. of things they do. 
But but yeah, we think about the proclamation of the family coming down as a revelation from God to Gordon B. Hinckley or whatever. Really, it started out as a legal brief or a legal memo drafted probably by lawyers at Curtin and McConkie or BYU. And then it morphs into, morphs into. Mm-hmm. kind of a, a central document for a church yeah. when it really was a legal brief to, yeah. to give us standing. Yeah. And, yeah. and they basically were able then to be on every single, you know, legal brief across the country yeah. in every state that was trying to legalize gay marriage. And, and your, your, the film just thoughtfully points out the fact that homosexuality isn't mentioned anywhere in the document. No. So it's able to, it's able to address that issue without ever mentioning it, which yeah. I hadn't Brilliant. thought about that. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that was a good point. Um, okay. So Hawaii happens proclamation on the family family happens. Let's talk about amendment three. Amendment three. That was one of several of them in 2004, wasn't it? I think so, yeah. I think there were about 12 or 13 states that passed similar amendments. And it was something that the George W. Bush administration did uh, to distract people from other things that were going on. They decided they were going to to get constitutional amendments in all the states that would prohibit gay marriage. It was just somebody's great idea to go out and attack the gays. Kind of a Karl Rove strategy for George Bush. Right, right. Let's and and Utah was one of them. They jumped right on board with it too. And it happened overnight. It happened without any notice. It was just there. It happened in several states. So Utah prohibits same-sex marriage in its state constitution. Yep. Right. Around what year? Two thousand four. Two thousand three or four. Okay. Yeah, three or four. Yeah. And that's kind of where the movie picks up. That well, I don't know. That rally for the family. What year did that was that footage taken? The with the National Organization of Marriage and Brian Brown and all that. No, uh, that, that must be later. later. That was in, that was much that later. Was much later. That, okay, so so was, Amendment Three happens, and then let's fast forward to I guess this is where you come in, Mark. Is that right? Um, yeah. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Um, I I was off being sick and kind of trying to keep myself going so I got really involved in, in kind of watching politics and what was going on and it was in 2009-2010 I started getting better and I was paying a lot of attention to Proposition 8 in California and it was just basically I sat down one day and read Judge Walker's ruling and and it really hit me it really affected me I read it over and over and over and I thought well now hold we're in the same country here we have the same federal laws why couldn't we do this in Utah Tell us what that ruling said, basically. It basically said, yeah, it, it, the ruling basically said that there was no way you could argue against marriage equality without bringing religion into it. And that does not belong in our in our laws. And that, thus the title of the film, right? Right, right. Yeah. So there is no logical way, there is no uh, intellectual way you can oppose marriage equality without introducing religion into it. Right. And that got you thinking. That's what got me thinking, yeah. And I should just say, Mark is, Mark, I, I'm going to just be honest. I've been in circles here and there. You know, I've been around a bit. I'd never heard of Mark Lawrence. Like I'd been to, you know, Utah Pride Parades where I'm sure you were waving at me <laughs> as you were driving by sitting in your convertible, but I didn't know who you were. <laughs> but Mark plays this super important role in making all this happen. I had heard of some of the plaintiffs, but I'd never heard of you. So that's one of the really cool things about this movie is it tells Mark's story from kind of beginning to end. And uh, he's kind of, for me, was an unsung hero. For others, he may be a bit of, not of a hero. And that's part of the fun of the movie too, right? Uh, yeah, I, I did not expect this, uh, the film to take that direction. I did not at all. But, you, but it kind of, you're kind of the axle for the film a little bit. Um, yeah, and I don't know how to take that. <laughs> well, so so what did you do? Just tell us, like, in I, the summary. We started off as a little discussion group on Facebook, me and a couple of other people, and then we started meeting at a coffee shop down on 4th South, and we started talking about it. We went, well, let's go for it. So I just actually started going out and talking to lawyers, and I got laughed at. You what know, was your goal? Was to find a law firm, a legal team that, that wanted to handle it. That, that would do what? Do that would take... Uh, make a federal challenge. We knew we could, not, we could not do this in a Utah state court. We knew we couldn't take it into a state court where we would have no chance. So a federal challenge a federal to? federal challenge to overturn Amendment 3. Amendment 3. Yes. And this yes. is in what year you started? Uh, this is right at the end of 2012. Well, it's okay. by July of 2012. So 2012, you're meeting a little restaurant coffee shop mm-hmm. with, with a few other people, and you're saying, let's take 
let's take on Utah's constitutional yeah. amendment. And I talked to quite a few law firms. And one day I just sat down and sent out a mass email to a whole bunch of legal firms. <laughs> and one of them responded back to me. McElvey and Greenwood responded back to me. They said, and, let's talk about it. You weren't some rich power broker necessarily. No super well connected you're sort of just no i went and sat down and i said right? we will do fundraising we'll have bake sales and bake cupcakes we'll still figure out a way of paying you yeah because um, the lawyer says we're not doing this for free right right <laughs> yeah um but they wanted to do it peggy thompson uh, was very very uh animate about taking the case because it was very personal to her and uh, it was in November of 20, 2012, we hired the law firm. And then all I had to do was go out and find plaintiffs. <laughs> uh, Derek and Moody, I, I, it was a lot to get them in. I had to go out and hide in their bushes. And uh, no, I, I really, <laughs> I had to convince them that it would be okay, that they would do well. They had a business they were running and they were concerned Tell, tell us that. just briefly about some of the main plaintiffs and how you picked them and why. Well, one of them was Kate Call, who was on my board. And she was a somebody, we were talking about this on the Tribune website uh, comments, and that's where we found her. And what was her profile that you liked? Um, she just came to one of our meetings. I said, the meeting's open. We were meeting at the Salt Lake Library in one of the boardrooms. And people who were interested in what we were doing started coming to these meetings, and we put our original board together, about six, about six people. And Kate Call was one of them, and she told us her story. She said she had a wife, they were married in Iowa, they wanted their marriage to be recognized here in the state of Utah. Uh, what I else had, do you look for in a plaintiff? That they're nice, that they're pleasant, no drama? Like, what do you look for? Yeah, no drama, but something I was looking for in all the plaintiffs is I didn't want anybody with kids. I wanted to keep kids completely out of this because I knew that that's where, how they would defend Amendment 3 and defend this, is by bringing kids into it. And I wanted, I want to spend two or three weeks in trial trying to, to disprove the, the, all the, the stuff that was going to be thrown out there about uh, gay people having kids. So none of the plaintiffs were to have kids. Okay. Uh, I've met Derek and Moody at a, at a function and I started talking to them about it. What did you like about them? They were cute. They were, cute? They, they were the couple. <laughs> they were the ones that you could put in front of the cameras and everybody would love them. And it absolutely worked that way. So yeah. uh, Derek and Moody became the face of the whole, the whole case. And let's give them a plug. They have a restaurant or a hummus yeah. business. Laziz. What's that called? Laziz. Laziz. How do you spell Laziz it? Kitchen. L-A-Z-I-Z, -I, I believe. So buy their hummus to support <laughs> yeah. you know, good local stuff. Yeah. Okay. And Derek just recently won the, uh, the Democratic primary for... Uh, Senator, Senator, right? Senator. Or Jim yeah. Dubacus is mm here. -hmm. Right, right. Wasn't there a third couple? Yes. yes. There was a third okay. couple. That's uh, Cody and Lori. Peggy brought them in. They okay. were friends of Peggy Tomsick, so she's the one who brought them in. Okay. So you start this case, um, and uh, maybe maybe just briefly talk about how it became successful. Um, we hired the law firm in November of 2012, and March 25th of 2013, we filed the lawsuit, which became known as Kitchen v. Herbert. Kitchen um, v. Herbert. Right. Herbert meaning Governor Herbert, Governor Herbert of the right. state of Utah. Right. Okay. Uh, that was the very same day that um, Do Don't Ask, Don't Tell, I believe, mm -hmm. was being overturned. By the Supreme mm -hmm. Court. Right. Okay. Right. And up to that point, Peggy had tailored most of the case towards what was going on in Proposition 8 in California. But then shortly after that, Edie Winter won her case mm -hmm. with uh, Robbie Kaplan, her attorney. And that's when it kind of started changing the direction of, of our case. And that's when... Uh, it really started getting interesting. But we were up to that point. We filed in March. We were at that point expecting this to be a two or three year project. We thought there would be the, the summary judgment hearing and then the judge would say, well, okay, we'll take this to trial. We expected a trial to begin in September of 2013 and then there would be a year long appeal and then another appeal. It, we were planning two to three years for this case and that's what our strategy was. We were thinking about professional witnesses to bring in, laying out the whole thing. My biggest concern was I didn't want the case to have to go to that new federal courthouse downtown because there's no decent, self-respecting homosexual is going to walk into that ugly damn building. Why? It's so ugly. Oh. <laughs> it's I didn't the want aesthetic. To go in there. It had the wrong aesthetic. I didn't want to go in there. No. <laughs> I, I just, we didn't expect it to happen the way it happened, and that was what we were joking about. We're going to have to go in that building, the one that looks like the big board cube. 
What happened was it was on December 4th in 2013. I was going to say what you didn't envision in your strategy was Judge Robert Shelby. Right. Right? Talk well, about him for a second. We had, I've actually met him. Yeah. He's Super a nice guy. guy. Yeah. yeah. We had the summary judgment hearing, which is just a standard procedure. That's when the state came and said, this is ridiculous. Marriage equality is not going to come to Utah. They just wanted to have a hearing and let the judge decide how to go from there. And that's a standard procedure. So the summary judgment hearing was on December the 4th in 2013. And I sat there and watched Peggy Tomsick engage with Judge Shelby, and she was brilliant. Now, you also have to remember the Attorney General's office was a, it was a disaster right now. This was during the John Swallow uh, thing, so they were, they were out of control. So the, the Attorney General's office in Utah was being investigated for corruption, right? Right, yeah. right. Okay. So we watched Peggy engaging with, with the judge for about 45 minutes, and then we, we watched these three guys, I call them Larry Curley and Moe from the Attorney General's office, make complete asses out of themselves in front of the judge for about a half an hour. Tell us what you really think. <laughs> <laughs> We were saying that you should have heard the things there. Wasn't it because they were trying to not bring religion in and debate yes. their? It was they were doing something impossible. Exactly, they were trying to, to leave the religion out yes. without mentioning exactly. religion. Exactly, we just sat there, but <laughs> they were so bad. Judge Shelby, we won then at the summary judgment hearing. Judge Shelby said, "No, these people are right. We don't have to take this to trial." And we weren't expecting to even have a, uh, a decision from him till January, and this came out on December twentieth. The rumor has it that he accidentally put his uh, ruling in the wrong thing and his clerk got it out. Oh, is that, is that the rumor? The ruling was, that, to, yeah, we don't know that for we sure. We don't know that But it sure. was a Friday afternoon, the weekend before Christmas, um, and there it was. People were downtown or down in the clerk's office getting married. I remember that day. Mm, people yeah. just rushed the, the county. We didn't expect you know, it. We building. had no idea. We had yeah. no idea that was going. It was as big of a shock to us as it was anybody else. And yeah. one of the one of the things the film talks about is how the the attorney general should have filed some sort of stay yeah, to keep the marriages from happening, it's but a they didn't. Right. Procedure: if you if you have a chance of losing in a hearing, you file a stay early. But they didn't do it. They didn't no. do it. They, did, they, they why had, did they do it? They had no idea this was going to happen. They actually thought they were going I to think, win. I it was think, hubris. Yeah, yeah, they had a lot of hubris. Yeah, I think they really didn't. They were overconfident. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, uh, they who expects think. Judge Shelby? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I and is think, that Sean Reyes? Is that who the person? Sean Reyes was actually. It? It, he came in. He after came that. in he like after just after okay, just December twentieth. Right. So right. that's not his fault that the state wasn't. Filed. Yeah, the, the first thing that Sean Reyes did was he went to the appeal in Denver. Okay, and that was the first time that we saw him. Okay, but yeah, this was all during that whole catastrophe at the attorney general's office. We don't know who was actually in charge of this. But yeah, somebody they did not file a stay. So um, they got on an airplane Friday afternoon and flew to Denver to talk to the appeals court about getting a stay. And the appeals court says, no, you, we don't do that. you got to go back to Utah yeah, and ask them. Utah. <laughs> and on the Monday yeah. morning, the 23rd, we had a hearing with Judge Shelby. And he just sat there and says, no, I'm not going to stay it. It took him 18 <laughs> days to get a stay. To figure out how to file the stay. <laughs> <laughs> so during that period, about 600 couples got married. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And there were some counties that refused to issue licenses, yes. right? Yes. Utah was it County. four or five? Was, yeah. 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 Utah County was one? Utah, Utah County was That's definitely one of them. Yeah. Imagine that. <laughs> I think Cache County was one. It was Cache. It was like a, a, some smaller counties to the south, yeah. definitely. One of, the, one of the most interesting parts of the whole movie for me was there's some sort of town hall, and there's some dude who stands up, and he's like, I want former, you to know, to all you sheriff. homosexuals, yeah. we mean you no harm. And then he goes on to talk about like how homosexual marriage is not innate. Don't trample on our God-given rights. Right. We don't want your dang parades and teachings in our schools. That was really great footage. Yeah, yeah. He was. He's. <laughs> he was a very, very passionate human being. <laughs> His red shirt said it all. Yeah. He had a red shirt yeah. like he was going to right? war, right? So remember, John, when I first saw that footage, you, you and Kendall would probably recall the question I had for you, which was, is this footage cleared to be in the dock? Right? Mm -hmm. Because you have to, and, and, and my second question was, is, was he even aware that this was being filmed mm -hmm. because I found the whole meeting and the and, and the rhetoric so outrageous I thought this is 
I mean, did you have cameras like hidden in your glasses or something? Oh, no. Trouble. And and the Kendall, and you said no. no. They were there. The cameras were there. Yeah. They, the cameras no, were there. No problem. And, and I down. was I was blown away. I said, great. What great footage. Kendall yeah. went places with his camera. I would never have gone. Yeah. yeah. Um, so shout out to Kendall, right? Yeah. yeah. Kendall, yeah. Uh, Torben, yep. yeah. myself, yeah. Andrew James, um, all four of us went to many. Tasty, so Many yeah. tasty rallies just like that one. Well, there was the, the big talk. I mean, this is what I experienced, what I went through myself, is I was standing there in, in the county clerk's office, and there were all these people in a line getting married. Now, these are people who had no idea that morning what was going to happen to them and how their lives were going to change. These were people who had no idea. They were thinking about going out and shoveling the snow in their driveways and finishing up their Christmas shopping. And here they were, people who have been told all their lives, no, you can't. No, you won't. You are not good enough. You cannot have this. Their lives have changed. And they're all there. The energy in that room was so overwhelming. And, and I'm just saying there's people, I, you can't describe it. But and you then, capture it. You yeah. capture it in the movie. Yeah. yeah. And then you have the people who are supposedly the religious community. Down there at the... They were, the, uh, they were the at the Oak, or the uh, Kentucky uh, County, like County yeah. building. They're down there like the enraged villagers with pitchforks and torches, and yeah. they are screaming and calling names. Um, Lynn Wardle. Yeah, attorney, Lynn Wardle was speaking out. He's attacking Judge Zika. Shelby. He's not attacking the mm -hmm. decision. They're going after the judge. Yeah. And Gail and Rizika, the Gail yeah. Rizika yeah. and all of them. And these are the people, this is the religious community, down yeah. there full of nothing but pure hate. Yeah, kind of with the veins popping out of their neck yeah. and the trembling. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, and so well, I was it shook their world, I think. I was in there on the other side, so it was happening. I mean, there was a chain, uh, it's like a, a factory, a marriage factory going on there. And it's all like mayors down there marrying people. And it's not, it, I've never, experienced anything like that in my life there's a there's a quote that really beautifully summarizes that moment it's kids are going to wake up finish the quote for me kids are now going to wake up that's someone came up to me remember when i said that i didn't want to bring kids into this that's when i realized i was wrong because that's what it was all about i was standing there watching this and a friend of mine came out and says you do you know how many kids are going to wake up tomorrow morning and their families are going to be normal and equal the parents are going to be married. Um, and that really hit me. I knew that's exactly what it was about with kids. And I was wrong to feel that way. Um, and that was a, it was a, it was an emotional and it was a very, very difficult day, but uh, I'll Beautiful never forget day. it. I remember. Yeah. I wish I wasn't in Cash Valley at the time. Going to, <laughs> going to grad school, I would have been there. So something that was interesting, Utah emerges victorious. But then, but then, like external to Utah LGBT groups start getting mad at Utah. Like that was a surprise. They're basically saying you guys shouldn't have done this. Talk about yeah. why, why did that happen? Well, that didn't happen until uh, to, before the, the ruling. Yeah. So right. after so, after Judge Shelby's ruling, all of the people who had been trying to stop us had been begging us to quit. All of a sudden, we had all these new friends crawling out of the woodwork. Uh, yeah. But so yeah. before, okay, before. So before, before the December 20th ruling, Peggy, mm -hmm. Peggy and Jim got heavily um, inundated. inundated with calls from all sorts of organizations, basically saying, you're messing with our national strategy. Right. We have a that's strategy. Reason, that's reasonable, right? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, but Kate Kendall says it best. She's like, you know. Even the smallest towns or the, you know, the people most unlikely want to be a part and want to, want to change their community. And what Peggy and Jim decided is they didn't care about the national strategy. They cared about this case, their couples, and the state of Utah. And they, they, we didn't, never... they decided we're not going to... We're not going to bother with. We with never the considered national. that. We never considered this. Yeah. We made this about Utah, and we never thought about what was going to go outside the state. I didn't even yeah. realize until we were halfway through this case that since it was a federal case, that we affected four other states as well. 
Colorado, Wyoming, Oklahoma, and Kansas. This ruled for them as well. Because they're in the same Because they're in the district. same circuit. Circuit. Okay. They're in the yeah. same Including circuit. Oklahoma and New Mexico. There's actually Well New Mexico yeah. had actually passed marriage equality in the oh, Supreme right. Court. Yeah. So they, they weren't half in on this. But we didn't think about that. We did not consider about that it. at all. So um, one of the unexpected turns in the movie is that the attorneys that got you the victory with Judge Shelby were sort of dismissed after, you know, g going to the next level. So what was the next level after Judge Shelby? Judge Shelby uh, was, that was where Peggy argued. Peggy still argued. And what was that level? It was so the, the, the district, sir. District, district court. court. So district court here. And it goes to one more level after that. Circuit. Circuit. And then Supreme Court. Okay. Right. So, so, so when, when they won... At the, at the district court level, when Judge Shelby made his ruling and overturned Amendment 3, uh, the appeal happened, and NCLR called and said, we... Okay, tell us who that is and why so that made people that's mad. The, that's the National Center for Lesbian Rights, and why it made people mad is because... Wait, I just have to say, there's this moment in the film where it just cuts, it cuts to Mark, and all he does is he goes like this. <laughs> and there's nothing that's said other than Mark just going like this in reference to NCLR right. being brought on. Right. And I and don't mean to bring up like sensitive stuff. Yeah, but. no, it's, but that's, it's, it's, uh, you know, we, we showed all the, all the warts because yeah. that's yeah. interesting why were, you, why were you mad about NCLR? Well, um, on January 5th, me and Derek and Moody went up to Snowbird and met with Dustin Lance Black. Do you know who he is? Filmmaker for Milk. Right. Right. And uh, Jim DeBacchus was there and Troy Williams was there. And we had this great conversation with, with Lance. And he asked me, he says, why don't you turn the case over to my team, my legal team, who was Boys and Olson, who was handling Proposition 8. He says, we'll cover your legal bills. And I said, no, that's, that's not what this is about. This is about this little all-volunteer um, nonprofit organization that hires this little... <laughs> Book it's David bouquet. and Goliath. For you, yeah. it's David and Goliath. It's yeah. about us. It's about Utah. It's about us. We're not going to turn this over to a national organization. That's how you felt. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That's how you felt. How did you... Did you did... Well, I think that what, what happened was is that Magleby and Greenwood, you know, realized that they, they, they do civil litigation, which is not civil rights litigation. They do civil litigation. So they argue big cases for big money, big business. And they're really successful. Yeah, I mean, that's why Mark sent them one of the letters that he sent, um, was because he knew that they were a really successful law firm. But, but they had not ever argued at the circuit court level in a civil rights case. So it's a reasonable case, to, it's a reasonable decision to say, let's get an expert right. who's seasoned, mm -hmm. kind of like the David Boys at the Supreme Court level, the yep. Ted Olsons. Right. Yep. Let's get someone who's got experience, even the Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah. Let's get someone who's experienced adjudicating at that level. Right, and that would have been fine, but what happened was five days after my meeting with Dustin Lance Black, I had a donor call me up and he was furious because we had turned the case over to a right. national organization. And I said, what are you talking about? And he, he told me NCLR. Went on NCLR's website, and there's Derek and Moody, and they're going, look at our plaintiffs in Utah. Yeah. Were, were the Utah lawyers disappointed, or were they like totally? No, well, well Peggy, had a, a Peggy has a relationship with Kate Kendall, who is okay. the executive director of NCLR. So they were not like super disappointed or? No, they're the ones who brought him in. Okay. Peggy's the one who brought in yeah. okay. Okay. in. Because yeah. it was Peggy's case. And okay. she yeah. brought them in. But we didn't know about it. Okay. Yeah. And I was getting donors that are calling me up and wanting to know why we had turned the case over to a national organization. Got it. Yeah, got and it. And I didn't even know about it. Basically, that's when we got picked up and tossed under the bus. Right. So, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, okay. <laughs> Things worked out. Um, <laughs> Let's talk about Gene Shar Sher Gene Shear. Gene 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 Sher yeah. Sher. I remember when he got picked. Yeah. yeah. Tell us about him. He's a, he's a bit of a character. He's a character. Um, yeah. you know, he, DC lawyer, Mormon guy. DC uh -huh. Mormon guy. Uh, he leaves. He leaves his very successful law practice basically 
to come and work. To come get his butt kicked. To come and get his butt kicked <laughs> yeah. by a, a non-civil <laughs> rights attorney litigator. Um, it was really quite something. Um, I'm almost convinced that they were actually on our side. His, his arguments were so bad. <laughs> okay, wait, which level did he argue at? He argued at the, the circuit court. The appeal okay, court. Okay, okay. Yeah, so we're, in Denver. We're bringing yeah. him in the right time. Yeah, right. Okay. exactly. And what was he like? What was his strategy? His strategy was basically um, to prove that gay people are pedophiles, that they're deviants, that they're incapable of uh, creating family situations. I think he, um, his strategy, unlike yours at the beginning, was to focus and bring in the children. Solely on the kids, yeah. Now, and also, yeah. He, he, he did get really ridiculous. He actually said that heterosexual men who were married, who had families, would leave their families and leave their children because marriage doesn't mean anything to them anymore. And I think that's a huge assault on the, the straight male community. And then he even started coming up with numbers. There would be 900,000 abortions. Yeah, uh, he was he was bringing in there. like really ridiculous statistics. He's former bishop, right? Yeah. Former Mormon yeah, bishop. Yeah, I believe he was a yeah. former Mormon bishop. And it's, and it's you know on the one hand, I guess a lawyer should do everything they can to win a case. On the other yeah. hand, you but, would kind of hope that there'd be a little more what? Well, I, I, to me, when you're when you're a representative of the law, you look at all the sides. You and his view. Uh, when he wrote his email to say goodbye to his his firm, he literally put in there that he it was like a calling for God. He was on a mission for God <laughs> to defend this case for the state of Utah. And so to me, that's inserting a personal bias into your job as a litigator. Instead of looking at legal precedents as, as a litigator. And so... You know, that's where I think he went way right. And the justices said, mm, we're going to just kind of rest over here. And it was just enough for us to get a decision in, in favor of overturning Amendment 3. So he lost. He lost. He lost yes. and, and I think it's important to sort of recognize that that's why this issue became so emotional mm -hmm. and so heated because... On a local issue, on a local level, within the state of Utah, mm -hmm. it's not a problem, right? Because generally people within, within the court the system and everything else, they're kind of on the same page. And, and you don't need to have some type of sort of non-religious argument. When it went from to a federal court in the or district court in the state of Utah and then up to the circuit court in Denver, mm -hmm. then you have the national organizations, everyone getting involved saying, hey, wait a second. That's, you know, we presented Mark's point of view in the film, but these other organizations who we didn't cover as much because that's not this movie, they also had a valid argument yeah. to mm -hmm. want to take over this case because it, we're talking about federal law here. This wasn't just a local right. issue to Central. Yeah. This, this case had become a federal law heading to, towards mm -hmm. the Supreme Court. Right. And if it lost, the case was it, lost. It, it, it had really huge that, ramifications. Yeah. And right. So that's why right. this sort of we, local pioneer team, you know, charging forth and to sort of I don't think rewriting we federal really law. Considered and, that. We never yeah. really even considered exactly the national consequences that this It could was have. huge. And then you had these these local sort of lawyers and and, mm -hmm. and it, we respect all the people involved and all their arguments and points of view. But when you take those arguments outside of say central Utah yeah. And you make those arguments in Denver in a circuit right. court, it becomes very problematic. And I think that's what sort of caused the case. And then, of course, when it went to the Supreme Court, they just said, we're not even going to. They, yeah. they didn't even consider it. No, they, they Sonia Sotomayor uh, read the, the, the judge's findings and, and their decision and upheld it. And literally, so we went from having a, a marriage ban in 2013 to the end of, uh, what was it? It was, it was October, wasn't mm -hmm. it, of 2014? Um, so it wasn't even... No, a, it, well, no, it was in June because that's, June. When, the, that's, that's when, right. when the Supreme Court denied cert. Denied cert, yeah. yeah. And so when it does that, it's like a ruling. It's yeah. basically yeah, it, saying that, all, that, that that affects right. all states in the country at that point. Well, no, no, for no. It, it affects all the states in that circuit. That circuit. But when Sotomayor 
rules. Right. When so don't, still when in so, the circuit. It was still in the circuit. Okay, okay, okay. But that probably was also problematic for other states and other circuits who maybe had a yeah. similar case or similar argument. They realized, okay, yeah. this is even more problematic. Let's just, yeah. let's just stop right now. This case so had heavily quoted. Yeah. 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 Beyond yeah. those five or six Absolutely. states. It was heavily quoted in, in, uh, in Obergefell, the final case that did make it to the Supreme Court. I think the yeah. Supreme Court looked at our case and they probably saw how ridiculous the state's argument was and they said, we're not even going to bother with this. So they sent it back and that was it. We were done. So we had marriage equality in June of 2013. Of this 20, whole, 2014. 2014, but this whole thing ended up taking less than a year. Yeah. Yeah, it was super fast. Yeah. Super fast. And in Gene Scher's defense, he was doing the impossible. He was trying to justify a legal position based on religion without right. invoking religion. Right. And how do you do that? You can't. You can't. You can't. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you intended it, and I don't know if this is just my opinion, but in some ways, Reyes, Attorney General Reyes, comes off a little bit as the bad, a, a bit of a bad guy. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's intentional, Sean Reyes. It's ironic because I actually have met Sean Reyes once, and it was at a private screening of Love Loud mm -hmm. in Park City for Sundance. Mm -hmm. So when he was there, because his wife, I, I went to school with his wife, so I said hi to her. She's like, oh, I'm married to this guy, Sean Reyes. I'm like, oh, I've heard of him. <laughs> but I had no idea that he was kind of negatively implicated in the LGBT stuff. Yeah. But talk about uh, his kneeling down and what he said and when and where. We were sitting there. I was sitting right next to the plane. Where so was the front, On the front row in Denver. In Denver. Or we were right behind Peggy, who was sitting uh, at the attorney's table. In what room? Or in this the, is in, in the, the courtroom. courtroom. Yes. In Denver. Right. After or before the ruling? Before. This is before the hearing. Before the hearing. Before the hearing. Right. And, and the plaintiffs are there. The plaintiffs are there, and we're just kind of talking amongst them. He came in and sat down, and he kneeled down in he front of all of them. Down. And he says, I just want you to know that you shouldn't take this personally. It's not about you. This is about the law. Now, somebody might say, well, that's really sweet. He's trying to say, I'm not trying to hurt you. You know, we yeah, love you. Everybody just looked at him, and it's like, you've got to be kidding. Uh, and we just, I couldn't well, believe it. Couldn't explain believe. to the straight people what... What's wrong about that? <laughs> this is a guy who's fighting against their civil rights, our civil rights. He's telling us we are second-class citizens and that we need to keep in our place. And we're not supposed to take that personally. Yeah. It's just legal. Yeah. It's, it's just legal that you can't marry the person you love. Right. So, yeah. But, but you know, from his perspective, he was trying to be sweet. Wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, absolutely. He, he didn't I mean, make I it. So. He, oh, failed, yeah. he failed miserably. <laughs> but... Yeah, it's, it's 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 a powerful part of the movie. It is yeah. very because I think he's a sweet, nice guy, and you know, yeah. a sweet, nice guy. And I think he was trying to be lovely. Yeah. And he came off as being deeply offensive, yeah. unfortunately. But I think I think the lesson in that is that um, when you're in a place of privilege, you know, you have to really think about how you are talking to somebody who's not in that place of privilege. And the things that you say uh -huh. and how you say them carry more weight because of your privilege. And we're, yeah. we're, we're in that right now with the whole entire country. Right. I mean, I, I really feel like our movie is still relevant because of, the, because of those sorts of topics. Yeah. 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 And, I, and I think to, to Sean's defense, that, that's I think he was trying to say something to sort of reach out. I think, you know, so yeah. he works for the state. He was named as a defendant, yep. his office. Yeah. So yeah. it's his office and the governor's office were named as defendants. So right. yep. Herbert and Sean Race. Yep. I, I mean, I, guy was in an impossible position. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe that was his way. I, I don't know, I've never talked to him, but maybe that was his way of sort of saying, trying to extend that olive branch. Absolutely. You, you know, and it, of it, course, didn't work. It, it, it was interpreted know. maybe incorrectly, but, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. it, he was in a very difficult situation, which, yeah. again, for us come stepping back as a distributor behind all this and trying to find interesting stories, those are those awkward, complex relationships that we often find ourselves in that make great entertainment. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So the, the, another like, kind of like punch you in the gut moment of the film is, Mark, when you show up at your kind of storage unit, and then they talk, you know, 
I, you get the you get the picture that like spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> well, I you know I, I try to pick these questions to make people want to see the yeah, movie because yeah, we absolutely. are talking about poignant. I don't want to ever do a podcast where I assume you have to read a book or watch a movie to enjoy it. Yeah, but I also. I'm I'm optimistic that this is going to make people want to come see the movie. So Absolutely. come freaking see the movie. <laughs> um, but there's this scene where you're like talking about whether, you know, after it's victorious, but after there was some serious conflict amongst the parties involved, where you're sort of, uh, I don't know, not feeling too good about the whole thing. <laughs> no, I, I lost a lot. I gave up a lot. Um, and I don't know if I'd do it again. I don't think I would. Uh -huh. Now that's mind boggling to me because this had, when do you have a chance to be involved in anything that's, that has national that's, implications that's for, for that's, so many people? That's true. I feel like I did something that made a difference. Like if you die, you did this, right? Yeah. Maybe they'll name a street after me or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I dare to do that. Right? I, yeah. I have a lot of mixed feelings about the whole case. Um, I was with this group of people and we were very tight like a family. The attorneys, the plaintiffs, everything was going well. And then since the best thing that could happen happened, we were tossed under the bus and they were done with us. And we worked hard. I, one of the things that I wish was more in the movie is the fact that this wasn't all about me. It was about my organization, Restore Humanity. I have a board of directors. And they worked damn hard for this. And the attorneys didn't even know them by name. And they didn't get any recognition for anything in this. And I could not have done them without him. Uh, Matt Spencer, my communications director, I couldn't have done this without him. And they don't get any recognition. Um, but I, I just, I have mixed feelings about it. I sure. don't know if I'll ever come to terms with it. You know, you know what? I, I've tried to be a part of good things happening sometimes in the world. And I don't think I've ever been involved with something good where like, it doesn't turn to kind of internecine warfare where, you know, this is just like an unfortunate part of activism where kind of yeah. sometimes activists eat their own. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's a circle firing circle where you're all firing on each other. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you can totally ever escape that. It's not, I'm not trying yeah. to like mm. minimize what you're saying. I'm just yeah. saying I can relate. If there was anything yeah. I was going to take away from this that I would want, especially young people today to know is you should at least take one opportunity in your life to go out and change something. Just do something. Now uh, that's positive. Yeah, that's positive. And then get the hell out of it before it gets bad. <laughs> before it destroys you? Yes. <laughs> and don't get, don't get lawyers involved in it. <laughs> Unless it's a lawsuit. <laughs> then you kind of don't have a choice. Then you don't have a choice. I, I was struck this week by, uh, by Supreme Court Justice Kennedy's resignation. Yeah. Like he's been the swing vote on LGBT issues. Uh -huh. And now he's gone do any of you have fears that this could be reversed? Is that even possible? Have you thought about that? Do we know? I'm trying not to think about it. Uh, there's a lot of people right now that are scared. Yeah. And very, very worried. It would be a difficult process. It would have to come up through the courts. Somebody would have to prove to the Supreme Court that marriage equality is interfering with their civil rights, with their rights. But who knows what could happen? I yeah. Think it could happen. It'd be hard. I, I think it'd be tough. It would be there's tough. been a lot of tough. talk. On, on about it that, that that it would be tough that it that it wouldn't be something that they the, the Supreme Court see wouldn't in the get near together future. and go hey let's overturn something yeah. they don't do it they doesn't do, work that's that not way. how it works they don't like let's, overturning their decisions let's hope well, yeah let's yeah hope. I mean yeah. they could go after Roe v Wade too right. yeah it, it could all happen and that's right. what 50 years old now yeah. I'm just saying the story may not be over were you gonna say something yeah. no I was just gonna say when when you were talking about the ending of the film and how sort of ending and we had a lot of discussions with <laughs> many. Uh, Ken, Kendall so and many. Polly and Torben about that ending because generally you like to end on a on uh, an and and in this particular case at least I was advocating that we end with Mark but there was actually another element which is more subtle in the film and I maybe would have argued that this more uh, there's another element that actually is also gut punching and that is because of the success of legalization of gay marriage in the state of Utah, the Mormon church issued a new policy right. thereafter about homosexuals within Mormonism and their children, the, yeah. the famous November policy. 2015. Yes. yes. I think that policy was a direct result of the legalization of gay marriage yeah. in Utah. And so for me, having, spoiler alert, having, having the film end with 
sort of Marx, sort of tragic perspective. And then the church's new policy, that then sort of opens the door and says, okay, where are we now within yeah. the state of Utah as a nation on rights for all of our citizens? Right. And what does the future hold? Because, the, you know, so that for, for me, I can sometimes argue that maybe the LGBT community within the state of Utah maybe is worse off because of the legalization of gay marriage in, in the eyes of the Mormon church the and Mormon. Mormon culture and Utah culture. Yeah. Outside the state of Utah, I don't think it's as, uh, yeah, as much no, as an issue. I think but you're absolutely right because they've come up with several policies since then. Yeah, and um, the November one was very, as you know, John. Mm -hmm. You've uh, you've discussed that a lot on your podcast. Yeah. There's a lot of members in the church that struggle with that. Some have left the church. Some stay in and try Major to deal with it. But it's a big, yeah. big issue. Major yeah. issues. Yeah. Could yeah. could wipe out almost an entire generation or two of the mm. church. Yeah, it's a yeah. big deal. Yeah. And it's and it's related to what you guys did. Right. So that's yeah. super cool. All right. So a couple of closing questions. We're we're coming up on the end. What was the hardest part about making this movie? And and you know. Um. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> you tied up in your checkbook. No. Uh, I would say <laughs> funding. Uh, funding. Finding funding was a. Uh, uh, almost three year process. Okay. Funding. Um, so funding was very challenging. Uh, you know, we won. So, uh, I feel like the, the gay community was, had fatigue and mm -hmm. they were like, we're not, we're not interested in helping you tell the story right now financially. They might, they were definitely interested in it being told because t I had so many people asking, when's this going to be done? When's this going to be done? When's your movie going to be done? You know, uh, but we would have fundraisers. I, 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 I felt like Restore Our Humanity and Mark sometimes. We would have fundraisers and no one would show up. Yeah. And, um, you know, we would make asks and no one, no one would, you know, take us up on our ask. So um, we went through okay, a, couple, a couple of times yeah. of, of trying to connect with producers to help us and it didn't work out. And so James, this movie would not be made without... James. Oh, come on. You got Mark. You got the whole... Okay, well, I don't know if that's necessarily true. I would say, it while she's getting a tissue, you. thank you, uh, probably the most difficult thing for me was probably patience. And having mm -hmm. to... It, documentaries take a lot longer to make than narrative films. And there are a lot of complex storylines that we're trying to cover in the film. Yeah. The Mormon Church, case law, these interesting characters, people, real stories in the film... And to get all those to weave together inside of 80 minutes is very, very difficult. And and there's a lot of stories you can't tell. There's yep. a lot of stories. This so is a local issue. That we had to kill. Yeah. This is a local issue that many people in the community were involved that aren't mentioned in the film. And we that's tough to sort of say you were involved in this, but we couldn't fit you in the movie. Mm -hmm. And so we had the push, we had the funding, we had the distribution in place, and still yeah. it was over two years. Yeah. Before sitting down and now having a, a little little oh, theatrical release, yeah. which we're very proud of. Yeah. What were the best parts about making this movie? Being able to tell Mark's story. That was important to me. You really? I don't know. I I just I am normally a very very private person, and I feel really exposed. <laughs> and uh, you're not super proud to have a movie made about you. I'm proud of a lot of things, but I don't. I have I have mixed feelings about it. I I I feel really exposed. Um, Has it been hard on you personally? No, not no, really no. I mean, with working with these people and stuff, I'm glad the story is told. It needed to be told. Uh, you know, it's part of Utah's history now, and it belongs in the history, and people need to know what it was about. And and I'm really proud that that story is being told. You guys should be proud. All three of you should be proud and everyone else involved in the movie. I was, I loved it. So what's the future for Blue Fox Entertainment? Well, the future for Blue Fox Entertainment will be to continue to find great stories, uh, both documentaries and, and narratives and continue to release them to the public in your homes and in, in movie theaters across the country. So we'll continue to plow on and and look for terrific stories. 
So how do people watch Church and State? The, the website, I will just say it now, churchandstatedocumentary.com. How will people, do we even know yet how people will be able to watch it? Um, I guess the first thing is come to the screenings. Yeah, come Talk to the Talk about the screenings. When are they? So we're in the theaters at the Broadway starting July 13th. That's downtown Salt Lake City. Yep. On 3rd South. Yep. And we'll, we'll be running, the film will be running just like every other film that runs at the Broadway for a week. Um, we're hoping to be held over, maybe. I don't know. Maybe if people all come out and support it, it'll be held over for another week or two. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, we're we're just that's going to be for Utahns. It's the best way to see it, in my opinion. It's it looks way better on the big screen than it does watching it on your device with the big Blue Fox Entertainment uh, text, <laughs> like across text across during the, the whole yeah, right? freaking screening. <laughs> Come on, we got to watermark those so you don't send them out to all your friends. <laughs> now, my mom is in the film too, and her comment when she she's saw a us, sweetheart, by the way. Watch it, thank you. But when we watched it, she looked at me and she says, "Why didn't you iron that shirt?" <laughs> so you get to see me with this shirt that's all wrinkled up, and my and mom. Your tat. Show them your tat, man. Tattoo. That's yeah. an epic tat right there. Yeah. You're not messing around. No, no. no. It goes on here and here <laughs> off my head. And, um, I has got a little Mike Tyson going on there a little bit, almost. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, hopefully my mom will be there on Friday the 13th, and she'll yeah. nag at me about the show. That's July 13th. Yeah. July 13th. And the Mormon Story screening? Mormon, Mormon Story screening will be on July 18th. July 18th. 7 p.m. 7 p.m. We'll do a Q&A afterwards. Mm -hmm. We'll try and get some cool, fun people there. Yeah, uh, so and can right now people can go online and order those tickets. So far, they only have the 7 p.m. screenings listed, and that's because we have the special event on the 13th, which is a Q&A panel after the screening and and the premiere. And then uh, on the 18th, the Mormon Stories podcast mm -hmm. hasn't been listed on their website yet, but that that time frame is held out for for your benefit. Mm -hmm. So um, go get those tickets because people have already been purchasing tickets in that seven o'clock time frame the whole entire week. All right. Because it's available. So. And then after our theatrical run here, it'll be yeah. available nationwide August 10th on all digital streaming on-demand devices and platforms across the country. So if you're not in the state of Utah or in Salt Lake, and you want to see the film, you'll be able to. You'll just have to wait until August. August, yeah. Okay. So uh, the the movie uh, is churchandstatedocumentary.com. Uh, everyone needs to see it and to tell everyone else about it. Um, again, uh, come to the Mormon Story screening July 18th or any of the other screenings at the Broadway. Um, uh, and I guess most importantly, James, Holly, and Mark Thank you so much for coming on Mormon Stories Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. You guys are lovely. Us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, good luck. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Um, and just a quick uh, thank you to all our listeners for checking in. Thanks to all our donors that make Mormon Stories Podcast possible. Please, if you want to support this type of programming, go to mormonstories.org. Click on the donate button at the top right of the screen. 10, 15, 20, 100 bucks a month, whatever you can afford, helps make this programming possible. So we appreciate the support. Um, check out our events page for workshops and retreats. Uh, coming, uh, you know, to a city near you to support people in faith transition. And a huge thanks and shout out to Tim Corey, uh, Cody Layton, Amy Grubbs, and Sharon Price, along with our board for all the, all the things they do to make this podcast and everything else we do possible. Take care, everybody, and join us again soon for another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast.